Over this past year alone, there's been over 16,000 people who've been arrested arbitrarily simply for being in the wrong place at the wrong time, simply for speaking up their minds. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown on over 25 cable stations from Vermont to New York City on the internet at thestruggle.org. Our YouTube channel, Struggle Video Media. All across the country, thousands are engaging in creative protests as part of the new civil rights movement, Black Lives Matter. We begin with a protest created by lawyers in training hundreds of students at Yale Law School who die in on a New Haven street. Then to the University of Bridgeport with our continuing coverage of the conference they held about the human rights situation in Egypt. Today, Raba Abdelhamid of Amnesty International and Medea Benjamin of Code Pink. Finally, Arik Asherman, head of the Israeli group Rabbis for Human Rights, talks about the situation of one group of Israeli citizens, Israeli Bedouin. Five or six hundred students at Yale Law School formed a human chain and then all did a die-in to protest the ever-growing list of casualties, black casualties, of police violence. No more. We must say no more. We demand justice for Michael Brown, Eric Gardner, and all those who have been killed as a result of police brutality. We demand that officers who use excessive force be prosecuted. We demand that federal and state laws be changed to prevent racialized policing. I said, are you with me? Yes! Yes! So with that, I just want to go over the instructions for our dine-in so that everyone is clear and the code of conduct which we would like to prevail during this demonstration. And a lot of If you're in there, if you're in the line, come on. to the University of Bridgeport's conference on Egypt. Rana Abdel Hamid talks about the Rabah massacre and other outrages. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so yes, I am involved with Amnesty International USA. And for those of you who don't know, Amnesty International is a human rights movement with over 3 million members around the world. We advocate on behalf of different human rights issues. Um, we're located in about 115 different countries. And our main focus is organizing. So my, my experience and, my, and what I'll be sharing with you today with, with regards to Amnesty International and our work is with regards to our campaigns around Egypt. Um, I actually, the reason why I got involved with Amnesty so early was because of Egypt. Um, I remember going to Egypt at a very young age. I was like 15, 14. 
um, and being exposed to the extreme injustice and like socioeconomic inequalities and all of these different kinds of brutalities that I would see just like simply walking down the street. And that made me and inspired me to want to do something about it. And Amnesty International became that platform for me as a young person to be able to engage. And so currently our two campaigns that we've been working on are deal with detainment and torture and arbitrary arrests as well as the NGO laws that have been pushed forth by the government. Um, so I'll start talking a little bit about the detained and torture and I'd like to start with a story um, of a young man who was detained by the Egyptian government. So I'll take you back about a year ago on January 25th, 2013 to mark the third anniversary of the Egyptian revolution I decided to wear a t-shirt to class that said, I stand with the rights of the Egyptian people and the rights of North Africans. On that same day, Mohammed, Mahmoud Hassan, an 18-year-old student, did the same thing, except halfway across the world in Egypt. Um, he wore a very similar t-shirt with a logo that represented the January 25th revolution and the words, nation without torture. Um, while I got into a couple of heated debates, Mahmoud Hassan actually had to deal with something a lot more violent. He was detained, take, he was taken off of a public bus because of his t-shirt, um, taken to national security, detained, blindfolded, tortured for almost four hours and forced to confess that he was associated with the Muslim Brotherhood, forced to confess that he held explosives in his home. And the only evidence that they had against him was this t-shirt, was the fact that he was supporting January 25th revolution, which would make sense because that's what we do, we support human rights. Um, but um, unfortunately, the difference, as, as you can see, if you could take a step back, you'd realize that my story and Mahmoud Hassan's story is very similar. We kind of stood for the same values. We stood for January 25, but the only difference was the fact that I was in the United States and he was in Egypt. The difference, that difference led him to being under police brutality and extreme, extreme violence while I was able to just carry on with my day. Um, and unfortunately, um, like my colleague here said, this, like Rabah, was not an isolated incident. This was also not an isolated incident. What ended up, hap what has been happening over the past three years has been extremely horrific. There has, over this past year alone, there's been over 16,000 people who've been arrested arbitrarily, simply for being in the wrong place at the wrong time, simply for speaking up their minds, um, simply for organizing peacefully, and this is obviously a climate that we don't want if we're trying to create some sort of democratic transition within Egyptian society. Um, and so Amnesty International tries to highlight these various cases. So for example, there is the case of Amr Rabi, who is uh, an engineering student at Cairo University who disappeared this past March 2014. Um, there is the case of Ahmed Ibrahim, who's among four people who died actually in a police station this past April 2014 after he was brutally beaten by the police force. And unfortunately, this isn't just with young men. This is also, the, a lot of young women also face these, this sort of violence. But the only difference is that it comes, it, the, for, the form of violence is sexual violence. And so right after the Egyptian revolution unfolded in March, we received phone calls from young women who were at the forefront of the revolution, who were telling us that in order to test their credibility, the police force was giving them virginity testing. They were essentially assaulting them. They were faced with sort, all sorts of sexual violence in, in, the, in the police department. And this continues to happen day, and day, day in and day out. Um, more specifically, just to give you guys names that you should remember, Azza Hilal, she's a, she was 49 years old. She was actually a bystander to a peaceful protest, was not politically motivated at all and saw that a young woman was being, being beaten by the police and she intervened just like anyone would normally intervene because this, what she saw was not fair. Um, unfortunately, she got caught up in the mess and was brutally beaten as well. And I'd like to take you back to before the revolution um, to June 2010 and remind you that one of the main reasons, one of the main platforms that sparked the revolution was the page, We Are Khal and Sa'i. And this was created because he was, this young man who's about 28 years old was brutally beaten by the police to death and the, the police officers were not held accountable. And this sparked people's ability to organize on Facebook as a social media platform and then in the streets eventually. And so unfortunately the thing that sparked the revolution really tried inspired people to do something has been 
continue to be perpetuated by the regime that's currently in place. This horrific detainment, horrific brutality and torture against young people, against people who simply want peace and simply want prosperity for Egypt. Um, and then the second thing is that, um, unfortunately, this isn't just, and these aren't just isolated incidents, and this isn't just like police officers detaining and torturing people. There's a system, systematic, there's actually this institutionalization of the suppression of any form of dissent. So we have this NGO law called the Law and Associations, which was actually passed for the first time in 2002. And the government of Egypt currently is trying to bring it back and has been trying to bring it back since July 2014. And it was supposed to actually come back into play November 10th, but because of international outcry against this law, it's, it's been pushed back again. But this law, called Law 84, um, requires every single NGO to register under very, very strict conditions with the Egyptian government. And this is extremely problematic because these conditions aren't basically like, you have to register so we know what you're doing, but it's, you have to register so you can't be involved in any sort of political activity. Um, you can't be conducting field research that we don't approve. You can't be doing anything that threatens national unity, which could be manipulated and interpreted in so many different ways. So anything basically that might be protecting minority rights, women's rights, anyone who is detained, anyone who is facing some sort of injustice that the government has perpetuated would not be would not be able to do the work that they're doing. So a lot of NGO leaders currently are extremely fearful and are trying to discontinue their work because they don't know if they're going to be detained the next day. And there's actually a case of 43 NGO workers, several of whom are American citizens and were actually sent by the US government to do work in Egypt, who were detained and who were tortured for information for the, the, that the Egyptian government wanted to know. And most of this happens under terrorist, terrorism charges, which don't, which don't have any sort of backing. Um, so just to recap briefly, you see this reality of police brutality, and then you see the destruction of civil society and civic society, which both don't lead to a democratic regime, don't lead to any sort of peaceful transition. Um, and so what Amnesty International has been doing is we've been trying to really highlight these cases and remind people of the names of these individuals who have been at the forefront and just like my colleague also said, their resilience and to show them that these are the heroes of the Egyptian revolution. We see that people like Asma Mahfouz, who was at the forefront, who made the video that sparked the Egyptian revolution, she's banned from traveling outside of Egypt. Um, and many other people who we hear their names over and over again who inspired us. So I, I also want to end sort of on a positive note because you're gonna be hearing a lot of negative things today. Um, especially as an activist, that's what we try to do, we try to inspire. Um, so what we see is we see this horrific brutality. We see all these unlawful, unconstitutional kind of reforms that don't make sense on an international level. However, at the same time, we need to remember the feeling that we felt after the, after the ousting of Hosni Barak on, February, on January, uh, February 11, 2011. And so what that feeling, I remember I was in Times Square actually organizing some sort of rally with my, with my peers in Amnesty International, and my mother at the time was in Egypt. And she was on the other side of the phone crying, very extremely emotional. And I could hear the celebration of the people in the background and hear the hope of the people in the background. And I want us to continue to remember that as international organizations and as international people who are in the United States working uh, on a case that's in Egypt, we have some sort of legitimacy that, we, that can allow us to magnify the voices of the heroes who are on the ground. And so with everyone else in this room, I hope to take advantage of the fact that we actually have the opportunities to tell these people's stories and to shine a light on their struggles. And so obviously feel free to come up to me after this event to ask for any sort of materials. Amnesty International is very open to providing student groups with different buttons, shirts, petitions so that you could actually engage and take action and highlight the cases of different people. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for your time. Medea Benjamin of Code Pink talks about the complete support for the Sisi regime coming from Obama and Kerry. My relationship to Egypt really came through my relationship to um, Gaza because I 
Uh, the only way we could get into Gaza was through Egypt. So under Mubarak, we went to Gaza. Under Morsi, we went to Gaza. I happened to be in Egypt when the revolution was taking place on my way to Gaza and said, well, wait, I think I'm going to stop and stay for this revolution. And it was the most exciting experience of my life to see uh, Egyptians coming out and feeling for the first time in their lives so proud to be Egyptian and the beauty of a people rising up to overthrow a dictatorship is, is something we don't often get a chance to uh, see much less participate in which makes the tragedy of today all the more tragic. Um, my uh, my brush with the uh, Sisi regime was very personal because I was trying to get to Gaza once again uh, with a hundred women for International Women's Day. Now one would think that was a positive thing to do to show our solidarity for the women in Gaza and yet when I arrived at the airport in March uh, thinking, oh, I was just going to breeze through security, they looked at my passport and said, come with me kept me hours, 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 finally threw me in a detention center, never told me what I was doing wrong, why I was being treated like that, uh, until they came in 17 hours later, threw me on the ground, pushed their knees on top of me, uh, went to put handcuffs on me so violently that my uh, arm popped out of its socket, and when I was screaming out in pain, they took my scarf and stuffed it into my mouth. Uh, dragged me through the airport. They so the airline said she can't get on a plane. She has to go to the hospital. They wouldn't allow me to go to a hospital. Uh, threw me on a plane back to the first plane leaving, which was to Turkey. Um, this was the way the Sisi regime treated a, uh, a a woman American going on a peace delegation to Gaza. And of course, it made me want to know more about how this regime was treating its own people. And that's how I became involved in, with many of the people here, which has been such a wonderful experience. And I feel like family with many of you. Uh, sometimes we joke because I'm a uh, Jewish, secular uh, head of a women's organization. And I say, I would have never voted for the Muslim Brotherhood if I were Egyptian. <laughs> Uh, and yet, I will do whatever I can to defend the rights of people, whether they are Muslim Brotherhood, or secular, or journalists, or whatever it is. And that's really what this is about. It's about basic human rights. And it makes my blood boil to see what my government is doing. Because when there is a coup, the world should speak out and call a coup a coup. That's right. And the US government refused to call the coup a coup. Now that was very deliberate, because if you call a coup a coup, there's a law that's supposed to be put in place. It's called the Leahy Law. And it says that when a government comes to power through military means overthrowing a democratically elected government, the US must cut off ties with that government. It means the US cannot be giving any more money to that government. It means the $1.3 billion that the US had been giving to Egypt every year should be cut off. But that has not happened. And uh, the US had another chance to denounce this regime, which, which was during the elections, when Sisi put himself forward as a leader that was going to allow for democratic elections. Many of the world's most prestigious groups that monitor elections says, we're not going to even bother going to Egypt to monitor those elections because the conditions are not there for free and fair elections. And the ones who did go, most of them came out saying, this was not free and fair elections. And you know, the proof is in the pudding. Look at the results. 96% of the votes to General Sisi? I don't think so. So the conditions were not there for free and fair elections. The US should have said, we do not recognize these elections. We do not recognize Sisi as president. Did they do that? No. Instead, yes, they made some murmurings about, we'd like to see some human rights improvement, but basically congratulated Sisi and said, this is a government that we have many mutual interests with, and we want to move ahead in this strategic relationship. Uh, Kerry, John Kerry, Secretary of State, has been to visit with Sisi. In fact, the first time he went to visit with Sisi, he said that we had released hundreds of millions of dollars already to this government, 
and that he was sure that we would be able to release the entire amount, that is another $575 million that hadn't been released. Now, keep in mind that when Kerry was there, it was just at the time when the courts in Egypt were giving out these uh, death sentences in sham trials, and the day after uh, uh, Kerry was when they sentenced the Al Jazeera journalists to between seven and 10 years in prison. When Sisi came to the United Nations in September, he had a chance to meet with Obama, another photo op, uh, basically giving the stamp of approval of the US government to Sisi's regime. So one has to ask, why is it that the US is carrying on with uh, business as usual, basically, with this regime? And there are a number of reasons. One is that since the signing of the Camp David Accords, Egypt has been used by the United States to, quote, keep with peace with Israel, which is really another way of saying, get Egypt's complicity for the oppression of the Palestinian people. And Egypt has been very directly involved in that, especially because one of the only entrances to Gaza is through Egypt, the other through Israel. And now we see with the Sisi government, the most repression along that border, actually the closing of that border for weeks on end, thousands of people on both sides trying to get through, people dying trying to get through from Gaza into Egypt, but the Egyptian government sealing that border. Rabbi Arik Asherman gave a talk at Wesleyan University on behalf of Jewish Voice for Peace and a number of other groups. He's done great work on behalf of Palestinian Bedouin who hold Israeli citizenship. I asked him about developments over the last year. You asked a little bit about the Bedouin. Um, first of all, still talking about this war, uh, as we know, uh, the damage or the, or the harm done to Israelis during this summer um, and anything we say about the summer has to be said being conscious that we're in the presence of 2,000 screaming Palestinian souls and some 72 Israeli souls um, and we're standing in their presence. Um, we know that there could have been much more death and destruction inside Israel um, if we hadn't had Iron Dome. Who wasn't covered by Iron Dome? The Bedouin. Um, and when we started implementing a kind of, a, in addition to the sirens, a, a, a smartphone early warning system, whose phones weren't hooked up? The Bedouin. And in fact, uh, I, there were four civilians that were killed this summer, and one of them was a Bedouin from one of the so-called unrecognized villages. What is an unrecognized village? Um, it means that although most of these villages existed before the state of Israel, and those that didn't are in places where Israel moved them, they're not on the map. They don't get any services, can't have a building plan, can't build legally, your, your crops are sprayed and killed, no school, no electricity, um, and so on and so forth. When one of them went to court because a road was, is being planned through the middle of it, the government response says, what village? There's no village there. They just don't exist. Um, when I, when you taped me last year, or whenever it was, a year and a half ago, when, whenever it was, we were fighting the so-called Begin Prover Bill, um, which, if it had been passed, would have led to the demolition of tens of Israeli villages, of these Bedouin villages. Some 40,000 people, Israeli citizens, transferred from their homes to these townships, which are kind of magnets for crime and drugs and poverty and despair. And they would have had most of their um, most of their um, remaining lands uh, taken from them. Uh, in two, 1920, the 
Chevra la Hakshrata Yeshuv, which is an, our, was an arm of the Zionist movement, then the pre-state Zionist movement, documented 2.6 million dunam for a gold-plated matzah ball. Does anyone know how many dunam to an acre? Four. Four. Um, were documented as being owned by the, Bel- by the Bedouin. Uh, the problem is that at the time, the pre-state Zionist movement, like the Ottomans, like the British, acknowledged uh, the internal Bedouin and, and honored the internal Bedouin system of land ownership and their own documents, as opposed to needing a Western title indeed. We don't do that anymore. And that means, um, as far as many Israelis, or as far as the government is concerned, they don't own anything. It's not theirs. Um, which is one of the reasons why, if we think this was, uh, and the Bedouin, of course, think that this is an awful program, the right wing does as well, because they think it's a giveaway to the Bedouin, um, because this program would have left something in their hands, basically. Um, the bill was frozen. Um, it unraveled last year because uh, after a, a big day of protest, uh, many people started saying, well, this doesn't look, another myth was that, well, they mostly, um, they mostly are in favor of this, the Bedouin. And it certainly didn't look like that. And so the whole thing started unraveling from both sides, from the left and the right. Um, but although the bill has been frozen, uh, we're not so sure that the plan has. So, for example, um, somewhere around a year ago, the government voted that where the Bedouin community of Um al Khairan exists, that they're going to build. They, did, they, they figured they don't need a legislation. They can just do this without legislation. They, they voted to build there a Jewish community called Khairan. Uh, there's still home demolitions in the Negev are also going on at a terrible pace. And there's a village called El Arkib. El Arkib has been destroyed some 80 times <laughs> since 2010. I mean, they haven't ever rebuilt like what it looked like before 2010, but they kept on putting up something. Um, they are hanging on by the skin of their teeth. I don't know how they're going to make it through the winter because everything's been destroyed or confiscated or impounded. And even when the minister in charge, uh, Yair Shamir, has spoken with Bedouin leadership, he said, we can talk about everything except el Now, when this bill was still uh, pa- trying to be passed, while well, it, well, it was still alive, there was a, a map attached to it. Um, we got some people that weren't uh, happy with us because we, in a video clip, we juxtaposed that map to a map of the Russian Pale of Settlement, where in the late 19th century, um, the Tsar said where Jews could live and where they couldn't live. So, so this map was about where there can be a Bedouin community and where there can't be. El Arkib is on the wrong side of the line. They hold no European style documents. So the arrogant Israeli apartheid regime assumes they have no rights to land at all. Finally, a Vice TV clip shown on Democracy Now! of a psychologist who was paid astronomical sums to devise the torture program for the CIA defending his actions. It, to me, it seems completely insensible that slapping KSM is bad, but sending a Hellfire missile into her family's picnic and killing all the children and, you know, killing Granny and killing everyone is okay for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is What about that collateral loss of life? And the other one is, is that if you kill them, you can't question them. Psychology, which is supposed to help our mental health, 
perverted into another weapon of the empire. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller, and this is The Struggle.